It was very bad. I just realized I wasn't recording. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Thought I realized it now and not at break. What else did we learn yesterday? Yeah, so Brian said we use dot find to locate a specific post. We also use that with use params, right? Which is similar to uh, use navigate in that it is a hook. It is some functionality that the router provides us. So what we did is in our route, we said, hey, there's going to be a timestamp in the URL itself. And we told that uh, that it was going to be in the route by putting a colon in front of it in the route path. Then once we had that, we were able to use the use params in that component that showed up for the route to get the information out of the URL and into our code. We then used the use effect and said, hey, when this page first loads, we want you to go get that information, right? We want you to go grab the timestamp, but now we've got a problem. We've got a, an array of all of our blog posts but we also have the timestamp up in the URL. So what we did is we took the timestamp information from the parameters in the URL and used that to find that matching item in the array. So find is a kind of a two in one. It not only is a loop, it's not only gonna go through all of our items, but it's also an algorithm that we can define to say, hey, match the timestamp up in this blog post with or in the array with the timestamp in the URL. And when those two overlap, we know we have found the right uh, item in the array. We can use the rest of that data in the object in the array in order to show the right blog information. And to further complicate that, we use use params from the router. We use the use effect. So that code ran when the component first showed up. We used a um find method which is built into javascript and on top of all of that we use the set state in order to get the information from local storage to show up in the blog post all of that sounds like a lot it is we just took pretty much every react property under the sun except props themselves uh and use that in order to pull off that functionality so what we're going to uh, do is dive in today on documenting that, understanding that, and finding some kind of visual that makes sense for you guys. Anything else from yesterday that we should touch on? Um, it's not from, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. you're good. Um, so it's not from yesterday, but I, I kind of have a question. Um, is there a specific website where we can get ideas of small, like even the tiniest projects um, when it comes to React and JavaScript so that we can start, like, this is a lot. I'm, I am, I am so overwhelmed. Like, I don't know about anybody else, but I am so overwhelmed right now with everything because everything is moving way too fast. And, you know, some people might, might get it. I'm not one of these people. I'm not one of those people that is getting react as much as i wanted to i thought it would be a little bit easier than javascript but i think it's just a different version it still uses javascript but it's a different version so when you not when you're not comfortable with javascript and then you're also having to implement that with react i'm just like oh, this so there with you yeah i'm so, so happy exona that you brought i didn't mean to cut anybody off but i put it on um the sheet, Max, like, I just need some small little baby projects. Yeah. I need just, 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 just a little something, just a little something. I'm so happy, Exona. Like, you. I, didn't, I just don't, don't, I'm like, I hope I'm not feeling, I'm not the only one feeling like this, but no. I just want, I just like, as, just a web page where it shows us yes. small little <laughs> projects that we can start from. Yes. Start to finish. And uh, no free code academy. Okay. Like, that does not, I don't know about anybody else. We go together. It's not doing it for me. Okay. <laughs> really just that. So, you know. Okay. So hold on. There's a lot to pull apart there. Yeah. One, yes. Let's acknowledge that like every single person right now is saying, like, oh my God, I completely agree. I'm glad I'm not the only one who feels like this is moving fast, right? Okay. 
thing to keep in mind here is that we teach more than what a four-year college curriculum teaches in six months. I, I can confidently say that, right? There are things that we don't teach at a college curriculum teaches like computer science, right? Where we go through and we actually sit down and we go, let's spend two weeks on learning loops. We didn't spend two weeks on learning loops. We didn't spend two hours on learning loops. We spent 20 minutes on learning loops, right? And so part of this is, this is boot camp speak, right? This is, um, yes, I am sure there are, are people who would say, I would love to take your six month curriculum and learn it over two years. Mm -hmm. But that's not how the funding is set up, right? right? And there are some boot camps that do a two year program, right? Um, there are not many full stack boot camps that go shorter than six months. There are some full stack boot camps that do six months at 40 hours a week, right? Hey, you're full time, you're a student. We've got plenty of stuff to teach you in that six months. So you're going to do this full time. We don't have those same expectations, but of course, everyone learns at a different rate, right? Mm -hmm. If at any point, our curriculum feels slow to you, we're doing something wrong, right? We know that this feels fast. We know that sometimes learning project-based is not the best way to, to learn comprehension of the topics, but we find that at the pace we are required to go to get everything done in six months, project-based tends to be the best way. And the reasoning behind that is because you can build something in class and then be like, uh, I don't know how I just built it, but it's working, right? I built a block. And then you can use some, some time, whether it's on the weekend, whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's you're a night owl and you do it after class, to start pulling that apart, right? And that's why everything that we've done yesterday, I'm like, we're done. No more features, no more new lines of code. We are now going to spend the next hour pulling that code apart, writing comments in, making sure we understand it. And during the second half of class, I'm going to ask you guys to make a diagram of it. And you can use PowerPoint, you can use Google Slides, you can use diagrams.net if you like that, you can use Figma if you like, you can use a piece of paper, a whiteboard, whatever it is. We are going to spend time tonight practicing documentation for the sake of understanding. Because getting all of this code to work is what will be requested of you in, in the workforce, but documentation is a real skill, right? Being able to communicate to another developer, hey, this is how all of this is working, is also something that takes a lot of practice. So not only are we going to go through together and comment out all of that code, we're also going to spend time with you guys practicing what a diagram looks like. Uh, and, and kind of giving you guys just that breathing space to say, let me try and communicate what all of this is doing. With all of that said, that did not answer your question at all. How do we take little projects? How do we find little projects and go from there? Um, I've got a couple different answers for you. One, go back into the curriculum, not for React, but all the way back to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. What projects did we build in JavaScript itself? That is going to be uh, the tip calculator. That's going to be a browser calculator. That's going to be movie seats. Movie seats is a big one, but a great one to get practice with. Um, that is also, uh, let me pull up the schedule, right? Some of which you might have to go into, um, into uh, the outlines. Uh, portfolio site is one that we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing in class probably next week. Uh, the Netflix project, you could look into that. Um, we did a the new site. The new site is a good one to say, all right, let me practice using different components. Let me try making a component for news story that has the time and the headline. How can I reuse that? How can I get those props working in there? Um, the only caveat that I'll throw out here is that some of the earlier projects are more websites than they are web apps. 
The difference between a website and a web app is a web app is going to use data. So that's going to have objects in arrays that may have an API call that may have some user input. All of that stuff is what starts to make a website more of a web application. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get practice by taking all of those projects and practice moving them over to React. So all of those projects are really good. Um, other really good ideas other than going back into our curriculum. Uh, second suggestion, Google it. There is no one de facto site where I can be like, oh, I love this guy. You know, go to his website and he's got 30, 30 ideas. But if you Google 30 React app projects, there's going to be a list on that. And what you'll find is if you go through all of the results on the first Google page, all 15 or 20 of them, you will find that all of those lists start to overlap. They're going to have a lot of those similar ideas of the calculator and uh, you know something that uses an array and something uh, like the weather app that we did, right? Those are all kind of project ideas. Feel free to get inspiration from there. And if they link to a tutorial on, on how to build that, that's great. Some, some of you guys may just get a project idea and think that project idea is enough and go out and go build it. Some of you guys may say, hey, I want a blog post, right? I want step-by-step -step instructions. I want to do it that way. If you are a learner, um, if you learn that way with the step-by-step -step instructions, make sure that you're learning from a newer tutorial. I'm talking about in the past year or two. If you see anything that says extends component or class, shy away from that. That's using an older version of React code um, that we'll probably touch on on the last day of React just so you're exposed to it. But if you see anything that says class-based component or uses the word extends component in the code um, or has something that has a render function, literally the word R-E-N-D-E-R -E -E spelled out, um, shy away from using that tutorial. It's using older code, older syntax that the entire React community has moved away from. The third thing I will say is go find a YouTuber that you like. I know you guys love listening to my voice three hours a, a night for four days a week, but there are much better instructors out there, right? So go find someone who says, we're going to go spend 20 hours on YouTube building this project together. Um, make sure also that it's using the newer functional components. Uh, anything that says component or render in it, shy away from that. But other than that, there are some great YouTubers out there. If any of you guys find a resource that you really like, that's making something click, that's making you have those light bulb moments, share it with everyone. If it works for you, it probably works for someone else. Don't need my permission. You don't need to send it to me and say, hey, what do you think of this? Just send it out to everyone, right? Because chances are one person is going to look at this and be like, what were you thinking? This is a terrible resource. I'm just more confused. But for every one of those people, there will be five other students that are like, oh, that's what Max was trying to say in class. That makes so much more sense to me, right? So those resources are out there. When you find them, share them. If you learn from YouTube, go find a YouTuber that you like that does React projects. If you learn from blog posts, go do a search for Medium React projects, right? Medium is a blogging platform that's used by the technical community. Go out there, find a post that you like, go build it. When you're building it and you get stuck, don't think, oh, this isn't part of the curriculum. I can't, I can't ask for help with this. Book a one-on-one -on -one with me. Book a one-on-one -on -one with Ryan. If you like learning from Ryan, Ryan is a React genius as well. He knows way more about React than I do. Go book with him. I work with Caitlin at work. We use React all the time. That is our, our front end framework. Book with Caitlin. Ariel and Karen learned React throughout the, the curriculum. Go book with them, right? We are available to help you, even if it's not a project we have done. It only takes us a minute or two during the one-on-one -on -one to get up to speed with what you've done and what you're trying to accomplish and going out from there. So. A lot, of, a lot of teachers will say, don't use external resources. They're just going to confuse you. Use our curriculum. 
we move so fast in our curriculum, I have the exact opposite view and most of the other instructors and, and TAs will agree. If you have time to commit to this and you've gone through our stuff in our curriculum and you're like, I, I want to push myself. I'm not getting this. I feel like I need something else to make it click. Go find that thing that makes it click and go use it. And everyone's going to learn differently. Some people are going to want a 40-hour React course where they can just sit down, power through the whole thing, and be like, all right, I got it. Other people are going to learn by doing that, that project. Uh, they're going to learn by saying, all right, I just need a tiny little mini project. It's only 30 lines of code. All that it's doing is making it so I can type one number in here, one number in here. And when I hit the go button, it adds those two together. Don't be afraid to start small. Don't be afraid to go big. This is all about personal learning, right? Mm -hmm. When we interviewed all of you guys, we said it's 12 hours a week in class, but it's 20 plus hours a week total. That eight hours is on you of how to use it. You may fly through all the homework and be like, I need more help with this. Mm -hmm. And that is go back to the week 15 survey. Look at those concepts, because if you're looking at those concepts and you're like, I don't get props, I need either a one on one with Max to get props or I can send Max a message and say, can you send me three different resources on props and I'm going to try all three of them. I can then go out and get those resources and say, here's a YouTube video that I like about explaining props. Here's the official React documentation on props. And here's a good project to try to try and make you understand how props are working. That is a completely fair question to ask. And if it, you don't get an answer that's helpful from me, go hit up any of the other instructors, go hit up your fellow students, go schedule one-on-ones because we can help you with all of that. We know this is fast and we've got one more week of React to focus in on those individual concepts and projects to help you get it. But use your time wisely, right? Don't be afraid to ask for help. We're not gonna kick you out of the program because we think you asked a stupid question. We move so fast here that the number of stupid questions the, goes way down. Don't be afraid to ask for help here. And if you don't know what to ask, that's okay. A lot of you guys don't know what to ask, right? Take a step back and go, when did I get lost? When was I going through this project and said, hey, I was doing fine all the way up until here. Max was moving fast, but I was getting it. And then all of a sudden we added this post page and I don't know what happened. Because oftentimes you don't know what to ask, but you know where you got lost. And when you focus in on that and know where to spend your time, that often helps you get unstuck faster. Give me a second. Hold on, hold on. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, if you have any questions or any issues, I already started putting my project into and I already developed all the routing and the pages and converted my, my code into that. I could show you my previous code and the new code in React and the pages. That way you have a better idea of how it transitions over um, and what you could work on on transitioning your code over into it and how to convert the syntax into um, the React project. But I already started doing mine, and I have all my pages working, and I have all my um, my main page working and stuff like that. I just haven't done the JavaScript yet because we haven't gotten to that point. Point, but it's a active project that you could see the old code and the new code and figure out how to merge it together. The other thing that I'll say is we're going to. Um, starting either tomorrow or next week, start working on our portfolio site. So that's going to be another multi-page application that we're going to have to move over to React. We're going to get a little bit more progress, uh, pro uh, practice with that, excuse me. Um, the other thing I will say is um, we uh, are working on the co-working memberships. So if you guys have a uh, co-works memberships, we're going to get everyone who uh, voted on the poll 24 hour access memberships. Um, so if you have one of those and want to bring a friend in or are looking for a meeting spot, um, 
don't be afraid to meet up in person, coordinate with each other, right? We all know each other at this point. Um, if you want to meet in person, you are more than welcome to use Common Space to do that. Um, you guys will all get access, whoever has a membership will get access to the Latch app. Um, so you'll be able to literally just tap your phone against the, the door, it will pop open and you can use uh, Common Space for that. Um, the other thing I will say is unless it's between 5.30 and 8.30, chances are this Zoom meeting is available. Um, so it will automatically start recording. Don't worry, only me and Hack Up State staff have access to the recordings. If you would like a copy of the recording after you meet, just shoot me a message. I can send you a link to the, the Zoom recording. Um, but this Zoom link is available outside of class times. If, if two or three people want to just get together and meet um, and not have to worry about the stupid 25 minute meeting limit, you are welcome to hop in uh, this Zoom room and, and use it for as long as you would like. Um, so this is the time where we're past that halfway point, right? Graduation, believe it or not, is right around the corner. We have less than 10 weeks to go before graduation. No, we have 11 weeks to go before graduation. Sorry, I did my math wrong there. I can never remember if it's 24 or 26 weeks. Um, e either way, we are right around the corner, right? We've got a capstone check-in coming up. Uh, I believe it's next week. Things are happening fast. They don't slow down. The good news is we don't have any new syntax to learn. We don't have any new uh, programming languages to learn. We have new concepts to learn, but they're not concepts that we need technical lines of code to understand. They're concepts that we learn because we start layering in the database, which is all in Java. Uh, um, we, I'm sorry, we layer in the API, which is all in JavaScript, right? We start uh, adding in additional sections of our code, but they're all using the, the uh, same concepts we already know. So at this point, we just start adding more power to what we're learning. We're able to say, hey, we've already built a little application for ourselves that we can play around with, but wouldn't it be cool if our blog could be used by other people on the internet? Wouldn't it be cool if our blog could retain that information and no matter who goes on that website, they can see the same blog posts that we create? That's the functionality that we start adding in. We do very few completely new apps, but we keep on going back to what we've learned and adding more and more into it, making it more accessible to other users. That was about a 20 minute answer to the simple question of where can I find small projects to work on? And my answer was, we're going to do more projects, but uh, hopefully that answered your question in terms of lean on each other, not only for uh, working on your capstone, but also shoot, shoot a message out and be like, I don't get this concept. Has anyone found something that makes it easier to understand this? Or go do a, a Google search for, you know, small beginner React projects and, and you'll get some ideas from there. And then also use your one-on-ones, right? Just because we didn't cover it in class, just because it's not a, an assigned homework assignment, um, doesn't mean we can't help you with it. We definitely can. Okay, thank you. No, that that helps out a lot. And fortunately, I was smart enough to have the recording going for that answer. Any other questions? Don't be afraid to ask it just because, you know, I'm going to go on a 15 minute rant. I'll try and contain myself. I have a question about what is uh, what is about capstone review next week? And then there is a check in on like week 17. Um, let me look at the schedule. Um, you okay, so our, our, I was wrong there. Our capstone check-in is not next week. It is uh, week 17. Um, and the reason why we do the capstone check-in then is because next week, you guys will have at least two days um, to focus in on um, your capstones. 
you will have two days in class to practice moving React component or moving uh, code you've already made in HTML over into React. So two days next week will kind of be an open study hall. Uh, it's all virtual, but it'll be an open study hall for you guys to say, I'm trying to move this over, or can you help me make this a component? Or um, I'm trying to use state here and it's not working, right? Um, the capstone check-in, which is scheduled for January 23rd, is a chance for you to show off what code you've moved over to React. It doesn't necessarily have to be hyper-interactive yet. It's just an opportunity. We'll go around the room. Everyone will share their screen, um, and it will be an opportunity for you guys to show what you've got done in React and what uh, you need help on and what you're moving into next. So that's that's what we're shooting for in the capstone check-in. To summarize that answer, basically we want to see some code uh, that you've already gotten done in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript move over to React. And if you're panicking and say, I don't have any HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code to move over, that is not a problem. You can fire up a new React project uh, and just get started doing it right in React, right? Starting to think about what chunks of code should be reusable here, what pieces of information are data and should be stored in state? How can I start using my dot map a little bit more to make this more reusable? Um, all of that good stuff is where we want to be headed for the week twenty, um, the week seventeen check in, uh, which is uh, going to be on January twenty third. Two other reminders before I forget: we are off next Monday for uh, Martin Luther King Day. That is the sixteenth. Uh, we do not have class on the 16th, and if you can make it tomorrow, please do. Class isn't starting until 6 p.m., um, but we will be 6 p.m. to 8.30 in person tomorrow. Uh, how do you pronounce this building? Gruen. Gruen Hall, room 408. Yeah, uh, yeah that's why I asked you. I sent Caitlin like this like book of here's where the classroom is, here's the map of where to park, all of this stuff. And she's like, I went here and I was like, oh, great. Okay, then you'll be able to find it quicker than I can. Uh, the question is, can we do one-on-ones during Martin Luther King Day? If it's available on Calendly, go ahead and book it. It should be. Um, if for whatever reason I need to reschedule with you, I will shoot you a message, but assume that I'm available and go ahead and book it if you would like to meet on uh, Martin Luther King Day. Any other questions before we dive into code tonight? Um, it's not a question, but I um, would you mind going over the comments starting from the beginning? Sure. If that's okay. Like we can yeah. do 19 through everything, but then just do an overall review. I feel like that would be a little. Sure. Absolutely nothing wrong with that, mainly because I think other people uh, would also like that as well. Thank you. Sorry, just catching up on a couple messages, making sure I didn't miss. Uh, see some of you guys. Uh, already posting some resources for each other, so that is great. Keep up that sharing. I had uh, someone ask me today, um, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Is, is that okay with you? And I'm like, it doesn't matter if it's okay with me. If it's a resource that is helpful to you, it may be helpful to another student. So go ahead and share it, right? Don't be afraid to say like, I don't know if this is in line with what we're being taught. Just share it. If it made sense to you, it's good enough to share. 
OK, I'm going to fire up our code. Uh, Brian already asked if we are moving this all into the day three folder. And because we're not modifying much of the code itself, we're only going to be adding in additional comments. I don't think it's worth moving it into day three and all of that stuff. However, if you feel like you're more comfortable doing that, your files, you do that and do uh, whatever makes sense for you. OK, so we're going to start at the beginning. Very best place to start. Number one. Oh, Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask if you could do a live share. Sure. Thank you. It's easier to see. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we've got four main files that we're working with here. App, post, post editor, and home. Now, just because I structured this code my way doesn't mean this is the way all React code is structured. My personal belief that app.js should have your router in it and nothing else. The reasoning that I like it that way is sometimes you can have an app with 100 different routes in it. And when you start putting more and more components in your app.js, it's harder to understand where do we get started here. When someone starts writing this code for the first time or reading this code for the first time, how do they know what a good starting place is? That's why I like to keep my app as minimalistic as possible and say, hey, we only have our router in here. Then we move our home page out into its own separate file. Some people may say, no, app should have your home, your home component in it, in it directly. Doesn't really matter. What matters here is what makes sense to you. So. What I did is I said, OK, number one, we need to import the component pages from separate files so we can use them in the router. I'm going to put that up here because that's more accurate. In other words, we've got these files over here. These files are their own functions. In order to be able to hook them up to the router, we need to import the component, which is what's on the left side of the from, from the file path that holds that component. If at any point you say, I didn't get that, say that again, say that differently, I'm lost, raise your hand, scream bloody murder, we can go back over it. So can you show us in the, uh, on line five, it says uh, import home from home, right? Yep. Can you show us the home file so that we can see where home is exactly? Yes. So, um, I can attempt to. Give me one second. OK, so everyone so loves my crazy lines that are impossible to tell apart. The import home, this file path here, is linking to my home.js file over here. That is what I have opened in this tab over here. The export here lines up with the import right here. Mm -hmm. The home here lines up with the home right here, which is what has the return in it of all of our HTML. I just have that collapse right now to try and fit it all on the screen. So basically what we're saying is whatever this home is right here, whenever we reference it, is ultimately going to be what comes out of the return right here. When we use the home here, we also reference the home down here. Those are all tied together. Mm -hmm. So when we go to the path with no URL in it, basically when we go to the root, when we go to the home screen, what would be our index.html, we use the home component that is coming and being imported from the home, which is being imported from the home JS file, which is being exported from our home here, which is referencing our home from up here, which is going to return every all that HTML in there. Did that make it more confusing or more clear? A little bit, a little bit of both. So if that, if that makes any sense, it, it was it was clear because you're saying uh, we are taking 
uh, the route path home, the element home. Yep. J then from the import home on the home JS page that we have in this file, we're going to export it from there, if I'm reading this correctly, and then go back to the const home, and then we're just going to take the return and put it back into the route element. You 100% have that right. Oh, that was a lot. <laughs> OK. So the way I think about it, and I'm asking to know if this would be correct, too. Yeah, go for it. That each import represents another file within that project. It does. And each file has at least one component in it. The component is this whole thing over here. The component is going to return out some HTML that is going to be exported from the file to be imported back in our app.js so that component can be used in a route down here. Okay, cool. The cool thing about this is you can work from either direction. You can work from, hey, the code's over here. How does it show up? Or you can work from, hey, the route is right here. What's it take to make this home element show up? Okay. As this gets more and more complicated, the answer is more and more class participation, right? It's, hey, I had got it up in my head up until this point, but now I lost it here. Let's go review it here, right? Or, hey, I think I have it. Can you just tell me if I have it right? Both Jennifer and Exona said totally different things there, but they both were accurate in what they're saying, right? And that's what matters. Everyone's going to have this in their head a little differently. And if you've got it in your head and have a light bulb and you're looking at everyone else on camera, which by the way, videos will be required to be on on Monday unless you, uh, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday, unless you shoot me a message. Um, if you're looking around and everyone looks confused, but you've got that light bulb, say, shut up, Max, give me a chance. I want to explain it the way that I've got my light bulb on. Okay. So const home, I'm sorry to like to keep cutting you off, but I really- Shut up, Max, I have, an, <laughs> I have a light bulb. Let me go ahead. <laughs> um, so const home is the component. <laughs> huh. Sorry, I thought I muted and I just clicked on mouse, my bad. It's okay. Yeah. So const home. home is the component and that's the entire component. So we're taking the return of that, which is being then exported because I'm, I like the way Jennifer thought of it, which is being exported back to the import home from, yep. And then that home is being used as the element in the route. For the path slash yes the path slash okay so then now we have to use the path slash to make sure that it knows hey you have to use this const home if you want to find that okay you got it okay cool moving forward unless anyone else has questions or wants to take a stab Sorry, at an explanation i keep cutting you off, but I just really want to understand this. I would rather spend all class not doing anything other than making sure you understand this. Because while the last 30 minutes of class yesterday felt really freaking fast, that does not mean all the other time in class did not feel fast. So it is more important that you understand this than we make any other React projects. Because this, if you go back to the... Um, the self-assessment from tonight and look at all of those topics on the left, we have covered every single one of those topics in this project. So if you can understand it in this project, you can apply it to your capstone. You can understand going back to the chat app that we did, how those concepts work over there. You can take those concepts and do your own little mini projects. Tonight is all about understanding. So I have a question then about the capstone. I looked at it earlier and I freaked out. So one question I have is 
each page of my website mm -hmm. is that another it should be its that's, own component that's its own component okay all right and so every component every page should have its own route yes. however you may get to a section where you say hey i've got a nav bar and that nav bar is supposed to show up on every single page. So instead of just copying and pasting that code into every element, every route, every component over here, what you could do is make a new file called nav bar and then import that nav bar component on whatever pages you need. That file is going to be by itself. And then we are going to import, just like we imported the components up here, we're going to import that nav bar and reference that nav bar just like we do down here. Okay. Let's let's just dive into that as an example. You guys don't need to code along here. This is just just an example. Let's say I want my nav bar to show up on my uh, my home, my post editor, and my post. I'm actually going to be a little bit more broad. I'm going to call this my header. So I'm going to make a new file called header.js. Again, you can follow along if you want, but you don't have to. None of it's going to be turned in. So we say const header is equal to a new component, a new function that's going to return a header that says everything is awesome blog. Now we want to use this header on another page. Because of that, we need to export that component out. Now that we've got it exported, I can go over to my home page and say import the header component from a file called header. Now we do all of that. If I start this up and look at my home page, I still don't have everything is awesome because even though I had that header come out here, even yeah. though I exported it here, even though I imported it here, I need to add it to the return. Yeah, you don't have it listed with the other paths, right? I don't need it in the paths. Because yeah. I don't need it in the routes because I'm going to use my header directly in my home, and my home already has a path. Okay. Header is a component here. It is a custom component, and we know it's a custom component because we use a capital H. So now when I go to my home screen, I have everything is awesome block. Now, I want that header to also show up on my posts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my code. I'm going to go to my post. I'm going to import my header from header. And then I'm going to make that show up here. Okay. Now I go back. I go read more. I've got everything is also awesome block. Now, this may be what I want. This may be, hey, I want this to show up on my home screen. I want this to show up on my individual posts, but I do not want it to show up when I go to the post editor. So this is an example of a component we made, header. It's a function. The function is going to return something out, going to return some HTML. We're going to export that. Then in our home.js, we can import that component just like we can import it in our post.js. That's now sharing the same exact code. I can then use my custom component by including that tag either in my post or in my home. In this case, I'm doing it in both. But I do not need to add that as a route in my app.js because I don't want to see my header on a route called slash header. I just want to include my header in my home and post components that already have their own paths. Did I get one light bulb there? Yes. <laughs> you like light bulbs? 
Yeah, so we don't want it. If we wanted it in everyone, we would maybe want we would want a route path, a route path, right? No, we would only want a path to that if we wanted to see the header component on its own page. Think about a route as another page on your website. So the header is just what is being appeared on the yes. pages that you choose. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a, a component can either be its own route, which makes it its own page on your website, or a component can be a piece that is used inside another component. Okay. So think about this on go back to our message app. Our message app had three major components, right? Or four major components. It had the um, header up at the top. It had the message list, which had all the individual messages in it. And it had the message input down at the bottom. But we didn't have a route because we didn't need a route. Everything was all on one page. We had multiple components, but that all showed up on one page. Now, in this situation, we have two different kinds of components. We have our home, our post editor, and post component. Those components are all showing up on their own pages because we made their own routes for that. So we effectively took those components and made it its own page. And it, it is best practice to make a new JavaScript file for each one of those separate pages. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, I'll be right back. So the, the question from Schneider is, how do we do file organization, right? How do we know um, if we should put this all in the source folder? How do we know if we should make our own folders for that? Um, trying to figure out uh, how much I can show without violating intellectual property uh, concerns. Uh, Caitlin is laughing because she has worked in this code. Um, uh, let me see. I can't show you the contents of the files, but I can. That's what I'm thinking. Um, but I have intentionally locked this account out from Tuesday code, so I don't accidentally show it. Um, and I don't, uh, <laughs> um, I will, yeah, that works. Yeah. V4. <laughs> um, so what I can show you is the file organization that we have in there. I can't show you the, the actual code running, um, but we have folders on folders on folders, right? Um, and we make folders whenever it um, makes sense to logically group that code together. So Schneider was saying sometimes multiple folders is not considered best practice. What is, it is definitely a balancing act, right? Um, you can definitely overdo it in folders. And when I open a folder and it only has one file in it, I lose my mind. I'm like, come on, why did I have to open the folder to get to the file name the same thing? Um, but uh, what we try and do at Tuzag is logically group our folders together. So we say, okay, I'm working on this page. I'm working on this page that's called message. And my message has 10 different components that all make up that message together. So that's when I'm going to make a folder called message and include all 10 components that it takes to make that one page work. There is no um, cut and dry agreed upon. This is when you should make a new folder. This is when you shouldn't. There are definitely different folder organizing schemes. Um, and we'll touch on that in the back end a little bit. We'll start making more uh, folders in our back end for model 
uh, View and Controllers, MVC. Um, that is definitely an organization scheme that, that we'll learn a little bit. Um, but it is really up to you to decide um, what, what your folders look like. Correct. Yeah. So a lot of people will uh, uh, group their um, CSS together with their page along with any components that are used on that page. So this is a, a feature that uh, Caitlin worked on directly. Uh, and it is so that we can uh, create comments, right? And have comments show up in our software so people can have a conversation. Uh, well, comment.js is the easy one, right? That's, that's what's gonna make that page show up. That's the page itself. Then we've got comment.scss. We haven't dived too much into SAS, um, which is the, the um, like an upgraded version of CSS, but basically that's where we put all of the CSS that's gonna impact that comment page. But then there are a lot of components, a lot of features that are built into our, com our comments page. For example, if someone tries to archive a comment, we don't want it just to archive immediately. We have a little pop-up that says, are you sure you want to archive this? Well, that pop-up takes 25, 30 lines of code on its own. If we put all of that in the comment.js file, it would work completely fine. We could actually take everything in here except for the SCSS files, put it in one giant JS file, and it would all still work. But it would be very unreadable code. We wouldn't be able to say, hey, uh, it turns out that when we post a new comment, we want to make it so when you hit the enter button, that, that shows up. Well, if we had a 3,000 line comment file, which is about, if we took all of these lines of code and put it all in one file, it would be about 3,000 lines long. We could do that. The computer would understand it. There would be no efficiency issues with it. But for us, when I am going into Caitlin's code here and I go, hey, I didn't actually build this code, but a user said I should be able to hit enter and have my comment submit. If, if she had put all of her code in one big file, it would have taken me 20 minutes to find where the comment creation was. But because Caitlin separated that out and said, hey, this comment creation is gonna be the text input, it's gonna handle sending that information to the database, and it's gonna handle closing out the modal or clearing the text box. Now I can go right into that comment creation JavaScript file and say, this is what I need to update in order to make that enter button work. So if you kind of envision this as how do comments work on Facebook, this is everything that it takes in production code that's deployed to the internet that's used by our customers in order to make comments work. And that's all in one folder. So you can see over here, we've got different things. Sandbox is basically our little prototype that has uh, little modals that pop up. So every time we've got a different screen that pops up, we put that in its own file. Um, we've got it all broken down over here. Uh, search, tasks, test profiles, thesaurus, all of those are different features of our website that we make uh, folders for. And then of course, you know, you think comment, that's all one thing. Well, all of these other components are used in this comment.js file in order to pull all of that together. And you can see, this is, this is not just something we, we make for class. This is production React code and our file organization of how we pull all of that off. And you can see our node modules and our public and all of that stuff. These are our real, real React projects. I don't know who asked that question. Oh, Schneider asked a question on file organization. There's your answer for a file organization. I think the larger your application is, the more beneficial it is to have a split up that. So I, I think, but I think it's helpful even when you're doing something small to think about splitting it up anyway, even if you just have a home.js and a home.css in a home folder. 
within your course order. Because you never know where your network is scaled up. And if you already have the organization in place, it's a lot easier to scale it up when you've already like started than to like have this big source order with like 35 components and then have them work on eight all the tasks before we imported them. And so that time it's kind of a general question. Yeah. Yep. It's a when they import headers like Yep. So put a header like inside the application, but on top of like outside of the browser buffer, it show up on every page or that's a great question. So the question uh from Brian is if we took this header uh, and we wanted it to show up on every page, do we need to go into every single file and put it in, in there? Or is there a way to just say, hey, let's just have this show up everywhere? Um, I was doing this to kind of prove a point of we can use a component that doesn't have its own route by using that component in another component that does have a route. But Brian's question is, well, if we really want it to show up everywhere, why don't we delete it from the home screen and instead import it over here. And even if we don't include it in the route or make a new route for it, what happens if we come outside of the router and make the header show up here instead? The answer to that is yes, we most absolutely can do that. When we go to the home page, we still see everything is awesome. But when we go to read more, we now have two everything is awesome. That is something that happens pretty frequently because we have the header here, but then inside this post editor, I'm yeah. sorry, inside the post, we have another import of the header and we're using the header here. So that that's normal, right? In that situation, we would delete out the header from here because we're saying, hey, in our app.js, no matter what route we're on, we want the header to show up. Was that, like, thing on that, like, this is the page. This is the page. Yeah, the app.js is what shows up on every every page. Um, and so that that is pretty common. What you want to be careful with in that situation is you're like, yeah, I want the header on every page. And then you get to your login screen and you're like, oh, I don't really want it on that. Um, so then it gets tricky. The other thing I would warn you about is taking this header and putting it anywhere inside. So if you put it down in here, um, you notice that white screens your app and everything breaks. It's because the routes is expecting only routes to be put inside of it and it gets a little cranky. Um, the router is also very, very powerful in that you can do groups of routes. So if you wanted to, you could say something like, hey, if a user is signed in, they're going to be on the dashboard page or the profile page or whatever page. I want this sidebar to show up for all of these routes. But if they're on the home page or they're on the sign in page or the whatever, I don't want that sidebar to show up. There are ways of structuring your app.js to support that. Um, and you and you can get very clever with the routes and the route groups uh, from there. Um, but from a basic example, yes. You could put the header in any of those routes, or you could use the header in your app.js and it would appear on every page. Great question. Any other questions? Use effect we will get to because we use it in two places. So when we get to that in our running through the comments, I will make sure to go over use effect. Any other questions? Here's like a good natural breaking point. So let's take a break. Let's be back at 720 and we will keep going through our numbers. And then I'm saving a use effect example for the end of class as well. So go on break. See you guys at 720. I code here. Okay. So number one, we did our example with importing components. Any questions that pop up over the break around that? Okay, so number two, 
we set up our router, right? So in this situation, we're using the browser router and the routes. All of that gets imported from our import up here, right? So we say from React Router DOM, anything on the from side is either going to come from our files here, or it's going to be something that we NPM install down here, right? When we use NPM to install a package, we're installing someone else's code that we can reference in our own code. So the whole point of the router is so that we can say, hey, when they're on an empty slash in the URL, when they're on our homepage, show them this component. However, when they go to the post editor URL in the browser, show them this component. And if they go to post and include some timestamp after that, that slash, then we can take them to a specific post. We're going to see that a little bit later. So we're in our home. We define our components. We have our routes. We have any questions on app before we leave it. Um, yes. So my question is for the import browser route uh, slash route slash uh, route. And then from the from React router DOM, is that going to be for every single or is that a norm? That's going to be that for every single project you build in React that has multiple pages. Okay. Okay. That, that was my question. That's it. There may be situations where you need to use something other than browser router, um, but for the most part, you would always want to use browser router. And when browser router stops working, then you can look into the other alternatives of what else you would need from the React Router DOM documentation. Okay. And then you break that down by each syntax that you have written in the function app return. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So the um, browser router here is the same browser router we're using right here, just right. like our home here is the same home that we're using down here. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so Schneider is asking, where's our index.html? How do you know we started at number one here, but this is really where our um our React code starts. It's not necessarily where it all starts. Well, if you go to the public index.html, you can see there's a div ID root right here. That actually goes to our index.js, which has our document get element by ID root. Then we take that root and tell it to use React to render out our app. Where does our app come from? That gets imported from our app file. Our app file has our function here that's exporting it into our index.js. So the index.js is really what takes our vanilla JavaScript get element by ID root and makes React do the React y stuff uh, to start pulling in our app. Same thing here. You start on your index.html, you go to your index.js. That's what links you into your app.js, and then you focus in your React code in here. Yeah, so this import system, the question is, why do we need to put our files in the SRC or the source code folder? Um, it's because this import system is set up in a way uh, to that references the files directly in the SRC folder. So what ends up happening is when we build our code, what we're going to be doing is taking all of our React JSX syntax and converting it into a vanilla JavaScript that the browser can run. So when we build our code, it needs to be able to reference everything in the SRC folder so that the output of the build does not get confused and ends up going into the public folder. So the reason why we've got to put in everything in our SRC folder is that this import system, which is called ES6 modules, uh, only works within the SRC folder. Archel, you had a question. So with the uh, going over the index HTML and the other ones, is that how we would basically import our vanilla into React? Totally different. 
totally different. The question is, can we um, import our vanilla JavaScript into our React? And the right answer for that is, it's usually better to go component by component and have the HTML show up first. And that HTML is going to require some work, right? We've got to turn our classes into our class names. We've got to, um, if we have any style tags, we've got to convert them over to objects. Um, if we have any um, values, now we're getting into that JavaScript side of things. Um, it's better to use state and have our value and our on change instead of pulling it out of the event target when the form gets submitted. Okay, now we've got events. We may have had some document get element by ID on submit. Well, we don't do that the same way, right? In React, we have our on submit and it calls a function right up above our return. And so you got to be careful when you pull your vanilla JavaScript in. This, this project is a great example of that. There was some code that we could reuse on local storage, right? Where we took five or six lines of code and copied it right over. But then when we did our form post submission, we were like, well, we got to do state and we got to change how our object gets created that goes into local storage. So there isn't a cut and dry, let me convert or let me translate this vanilla JavaScript code into React. We get better at, and we can practice at that, but there are certain concepts like state that just don't directly translate to JavaScript. So we can say, hey, the goal of this vanilla JavaScript code is to pull the values out of the form. And in React, we can say, hey, the goal of state is to make sure that we're keeping track of every letter that gets pressed so we can reference that later. Those two are accomplishing the same thing, but the way we write that code is completely different. So yes, there are some parts of our HTML where we can just copy and paste it right in. There are some parts of our JavaScript that we can copy and paste it right in. But the concepts themselves are different. And because of that, the way we write that code is going to be not directly translatable between the two languages. Um, you know, there are some words in, in any language that are uh, describing a very specific thing. And then you try and translate that into English and you're like, there is no word for, for, for that, right? Um, that happens when we translate code across. And there are some tools um, that will help you convert that code over, um, but it's a good process to practice because then you're uh, making sure that those React concepts are actually syncing in. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, we've got number three, we've got our route showing up, we've got our home component, it's all getting imported from up here. So if we go over, we could open our home from the uh, left sidebar here, or a little trick for you. Um, VS Code is smart enough to know that your home here is your same home here, which is your same home over here. So if you hold in command on your keyboard and click on that home component, it will actually open up that home file for you, which is a, a way you may have seen me navigating around more quickly, um, is being able to pop that open because VS Code is smart enough to know that home is coming from the home file here. Okay, so our home, give me one second, I want to see in our posts, not in our posts, in our posts editor, we left off on number 18. So we're going to start at number 19. We are going to say number 19, define home component that is referenced as a route in app.js. Then we come down and we get in let me ask you guys would you prefer us to comment the rest of this code out or go in the order that we have written so far anyone have a preference no. going in the order we already have Okay, so yeah, let's let's go through what it takes to get to 19, and then we'll keep going from there. So what happens the first time is our homepage loads, but there aren't any posts on it. 
right? It's an empty page. So what we do is we end up going into our post editor. And this is where our number four picks up. It technically does go through code that we have on Home.js. But if we're talking about, hey, the first time this loads, there are no posts. What do we do? We click on the add post button. That takes us into number four. So number four is saying we're going to set up three variables in state. And really, it's kind of six variables because whenever we use a use state, we get access to two pieces of information. The value that is stored in the state plus a function we can use to update that value in state. Um, so we set up three variables. All three of them are tied to use state, and we get access to the variable itself and a function to set it. I saw some gears turning there on a potential question on a couple of your faces. Do we have a question? So for you state, um, for instance, the const title. So the const title is what it is now. And Correct. then set state is what it's going to be updated to. Correct. Okay. And cool. what title is now, what the initial value of title is, is what goes in our parameters here. Okay. Can I hear that again? So set, it made sense to me like two minutes, two seconds ago, and then I lost it. Okay. So we've got the title, so, but set title updates state when something new. Correct. So right here, focus in just on title. What we do is we import use state from React. Then we come down here and we say, what's the initial value of the title going to be? That's what's ever in these parentheses here. So if I wanted um, a good title to show up, what I could do is when I go into my post editor, I have a good title already showing up here. Mm -hmm. That's because we put it here, which is the initial value, which means title is going to have a good title already set in it. That title is ending up getting used down in this input where we have the value set to title. Mm -hmm. That's what makes a good title show up in this title for the first time. Once we take that, what if we type a letter in there? What if we want to say a good titles? Well, what happens is this on change event fires. The on change gets the value out from the target of the event and calls set title. Set title now takes whatever is in the event target value that is now going to be a good titles, come up to where we define that set title and update whatever is in the parentheses into the variable called title. That title, now that it's changed, because we set it through state, is going to update the value here to make the value show up as a good title. Okay. So we start with whatever our initial value is. Whatever that initial value is gets stored into title. Title goes down and it shows that value up in the input. Then a user clicks on something or types something in. We call the set title with whatever they typed in. The set title then comes up to the set title here and updates the value in here. Because we set a new value into the state, the value down here is going to get updated. Feeling good? Yeah. So we okay. start with the, sorry. Oh, go for it. So we start with the use state. Mm -hmm. And for that example, it's an empty. So it's empty. Yep. And then we go to the value state, value title. Mm -hmm. See that if we have an on change, mm -hmm. it will go back to set title mm -hmm. and then go back up top to title state. Yep. We take whatever the value is of the input 
and mm -hmm. set that into the title here. And because we set it into the title here, it's smart enough to know that this value has changed and to show what got typed in. Okay, so the value itself changes again. Correct. Gotcha. And whenever we type any single letter, we call that set title again. Okay, cool. So now we set up another hook, just like use state is a hook, use navigate is another hook. We're hooking in to some functionality either built into React or built into one of the packages. So what we do is we get access to this function called navigate to. We don't use that yet. We just get us access to it so that when we want to navigate somewhere else, we have access to this navigate to function. Mm -hmm. And this use navigate is coming in from our import, which is getting exported from React Router DOM. Okay, now we come down and we go from five to seven C. That's not right. We got to go find our six first because this doesn't run until the form is submitted. So we come down, we got number five, we go down, we find our number six, six A. When the user types into the input field, update the letters that they pressed into the state. That's what we just went through. Same for 6B and 6C. Whenever they type in any one of these, we're going to go update state. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we get to form 7A. So we say 7A, they clicked the button submit. Mm -hmm. That goes up to 7B, which says, hey, the form has been submitted. Go run this function called add post. Mm -hmm. So from add post, we go up to our add post 7c. Mm -hmm. Now we're in JavaScript, different syntax, no problem. We have access to the event. That event is what causes the whole page to refresh because it's submitting the form. And we're like, we don't want you to do that. We're going to tell you what we want you to do instead of the default action. Then we come down into number nine. And we're like, all right, we got to create one grouping of information that's going to contain all of the information about this post. It's going to have four keys. Three of those values are going to come from state. The fourth key is going to be called timestamp. And the value of the timestamp we're going to generate out right here. Now, these three values are, are, and keys are using the shorthand. So we're basically saying take the title, the tagline, and the content from the state and put them in keys called title, tagline, and content inside of this post object. Mm -hmm. Now, why did title, tagline, and content change? Because when we typed in to those inputs, the set were being run on all three of them. So now title, tagline, and content that we're referencing right here are getting added to this new object along with a key of timestamp and the value of the current date. And they're all getting stored into an object called post. Okay. Once we've got our post made, we then console log it out because the computer is doing crazy shit under the hood and we want to see what it's doing. So we console log out the post to make sure that all of the values that we expect are inside that object. The code would run perfectly fine if we took number 10 out, but there would be a lot more steps that it could potentially break at that we don't really know whether or not this is the problem or something further down the line is the problem. So we console log it out to be, to be sure. Then we create this empty variable called posts, right? This is just a placeholder. This is saying, hey, posts could either come from our local storage if they exist, or if they don't exist, we want to make an empty array. So we create this thing called posts, which is just a placeholder. We then go to local storage, get out the posts, and store that in stored posts. We then say, if there are stored posts, if posts have been created already, they're going to be in a string because they're coming out of local storage. So take that string of stored posts and parse it out 
using JSON to put that in our placeholder of posts from right up here. Now posts isn't empty anymore. It has the, the data from the stored posts in local storage. However, if there are not stored posts, we probably haven't created a post yet. This is our first post. So make posts equal to an empty array so that we can add items into it. Now, we take our post, that's our object that we just created up here with all of our information from state. We take all of that and we push that into the array of posts, whether that array has no items in it yet and we are just adding our first item into it, or whether all those items came from local storage, we now have it as an array that we can push our object of all of the information in the post. So when you when when you see something as post that push posts where is it pushing it to like what exactly does that to the post? array of posts okay. which is either going to be an empty array mm -hmm. or the array that got parsed out of the stored posts from local storage okay using json okay using json so this post and this post are the exact same thing as this post Mm -hmm. which means either this thing is going to end up in posts or this thing is going to end up in posts. But either way, this post is the same post as right here. So we're going to push whatever our post object is from up here. Okay. And the post object was the title, tagline, timestamp. And content. Yes. And content. Okay, cool. That one. Okay, cool. So I just want to rephrase it. So let posts, posts will either be stored posts or new posts, depending on what they exist or not. Yes. I just wanted to make sure my comment was right. Thank you. And we know it's either one or the other because we're using an if statement here. So there's no way this code can run and this code can run. Either there are stored posts, at which point we need to use JSON to, to figure out what they are, or there aren't stored posts, at which point we need to start an empty list so we have something to add it to. Okay. Okay. So we come down here, and now we've got to go in reverse. We've got our posts, but our posts are an array. We can't store an array in local storage. So we take our posts array and we turn it into a string using JSON. Because this is where now we have posts to store away, right? Correct. We pulled the posts out or we made an empty list. We took our current post and we shoved it into an object that gets shoved into the list. Now we need to take that list and convert it back into a string. Once we have it as a string, we can take that and shove that into local storage under a key called posts. Under a key called posts. Okay. <clears throat> now the last thing we need to do is take our navigate to and navigate back to the home page. This navigate to is coming from our navigate to here, which is using navigate which is coming from our import, which is getting imported from the router. And then navigate to slash is the router, is the router that we have on our, on our app page. Okay. Which means cool. because it's a slash here, it's going to take us to the home page, which is going to take us to 19, the home component that's referenced. Gotcha. So we were done making posts. We wanted to store them. We stored them. And once that happened, why we click to submit, like to store it. We click submit to store it. And then we, we did the object. It. We did all the local storage stuff. We put it back in local storage. Now, when you make a new blog post and you hit the save button or the, the post button or the publish button, you don't want to stay on that page you want to go back to your home screen. Right. Okay. So you can either view them or add more. Okay. Yep. 
So now, because we navigated to the home screen, the path changed, the router switched us over, and is now showing us the home screen. So now in our home screen, we have the home that's all linked up in app.js. And we come down here and we say, number 20, create a new state variable to hold our posts. The reason why we need to do that is we need to link up our local storage to our state. Whenever we have a piece of data that's going to change, we use state in React to show that to the end user. What is data? It can be anything. It can be an object. It can be an array. It could be a string. In our post editor, we had some data, the title, the tagline, and the content that the user could edit. So that all had to go into state. In here, we do it in reverse we've got some posts stored somewhere that we want to show to the end user. So we create this thing because when the page first loads, we're not going to have those posts. But one, once we do, we're going to set them into the state. That state is going to get updated and now automatically show the rest of that. So what we do is we set this up and then we say, OK, this use effect is going to run after the, the page shows up for the first time. So we actually don't hit this use effect first. What we do is we come down into our return. We come down and it's like, great, show an H1, show a row. Whoa, post in state map. What post do we have in state? State started out as empty. So here we say, number 21, this loop doesn't run yet because the posts from local storage have not been loaded into state. So even though we've got this whole fancy map, it comes down here, it says post in state, that's an empty array. There's nothing for us to do here. Then the page goes, wait a second, I'm not done. You told me to do this use effect when the page first loads. The empty parentheses are telling it, hey, when the page first loads, when you show up for the first time, go do the code in here. So what we do is we come down in here and say number 22, the page loads for the first time, run the code in here. That says number 23, go get the posts from local storage. And then I'm going to kind of simplify here, number 24, either parse the posts or assume there aren't any and use an empty list instead. Pausing, any questions? Archel, go for it. So I understand that you put there. It's going to run the first time. Yes. But I think why I'm still having a little bit of trouble. Why is that number 22 as opposed to what we just know? Because the first time this runs, it's going to have the return come out for the first time, and then it's going to do the use effect. And the reason why we want to do it, the use effect, after the first time this loads instead of before the first time this loads is oftentimes you're going to put an API call in your use effect. You're going to say, when this page shows up, go to my server, go ask my database what posts are in there. And when you get that response back, then go set that into state to make it go show up. The problem is that could take five seconds to load. So what you may want to do is have your header that says everything is awesome blog and have a link to your new post and all of that stuff 
but then have a screen that says loading dot, dot, dot. And then that use effect is going to go run. It's going to make the API call. It's going to get the data. It's going to set it into state. Now that it's in state, it's going to go back to your return and your return goes, oh, I don't need to show loading anymore. I'm going to just show all of those posts. So the use effect runs after the first return actually shows up. We'll see that in more in depth when we start making our API calls. Um, we'll see that in effect. So we come up to 23. We either parse the posts or we make an empty list. And then we number 25, take the results of number 24 and set them into state. 25 actually triggers 26, which is update the posts in state based off the parameter of set posts in state from line number 25. In other words, we're taking our posts here, using the set posts here, and updating posts in state here. So we're saying this set post in state is coming from this set posts in state. That means whatever we use in our posts here is going to update our posts in state here. Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, so we, um, so starting from line 20, we created a new state variable, okay? Yep. Which is the, the let post and yep. state, blah, 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 all of that. Then from there, we go to, where's 21? So we go down here. So this is where I'm confused. Why are we jumping from there to here? So you're saying finish this off, finish this entire code. Once you're done with taking that post in state, return this. Now that you've made something show up for the first time, mm -hmm. whether that's a loading screen, whether that's your H1, whatever this is producing, that's mm -hmm. gonna show up for the user for the first time. Okay. Once it is done making this return run, once mm -hmm. that shows up to the user, we then go up and deal with the use state. Okay. And I'm sorry, the use effect. Okay. I spoke of the use effect. So we say, create these things in state. Then mm -hmm. we say, go make the return show up for the first time. Mm -hmm. And once the return is done showing up, then we go up and we find any use effects that are supposed to run. Okay. And that happens when the page first loads. Yes. So we come in, we do our use state. That's number 20. Mm -hmm. Then we say, hey, ignore this use effect. We do those use effects after the first time this shows up. Mm -hmm. Then we come down into this return and we say, hey, we're going to make an H1 show up. We're going to make a div class row. Oh, post in state. What's in posts in state? The first time this loads, nothing. It's an empty array. Mm -hmm. So we ignore this whole thing in here because it's an empty array. And then the, the React goes, I'm done, right? And it goes, oh, crap, I forgot. I've got a use effect that I've got to go run because my H1 is showing up and there's nothing to loop over here. So mm -hmm. I've got to go do that use effect now because I made it show up for the first time. Okay. So now we come up to 22. Now we're inside the use effect because the page is loaded for the first time and we've got to do all the stuff in here. Okay. So we say, okay, now go to local storage, so then go the parse. Local, sorry, oh, go get ahead. the item post from local yep. storage and set it to stored post. Yes. So now we're, so let post is an empty variable. Var variable. So if we have stored par posts, we parse it into J uh, by, uh, by using JSON. Yep. And then we set that to posts. If that doesn't work, that's an empty empty array. Correct. 
Not that if it doesn't work, it's that if there aren't any stored posts. So if there's any stored posts, that's an empty array. Correct. If there aren't any stored posts, then it's an empty array. Yes. Okay. okay. And then that's where we get the results from set stored posts equals yep. posts. And then we go back up top to use state. And a new set post is equal to the post in state. Yes. So we, we take posts that we just dealt with here. Mm -hmm. We set it in using this function, which means posts in state now has whatever posts has in it. Okay. So then we come down and we say, whoa, posts in state changed. Mm. So we have number 27. the state was updated from number 25 and 26. So we need to rerun this loop. Loop over every item in state and return out what each post is supposed to look like. Okay. Now, this is our individual post. That's what number 27 is giving us access to. And then we come down here and say number 28, set a unique key for each item in posts, so React, can keep track of them if they change. That's what our key is doing here. That's the requirement of React under the hood. We also do stuff like number 29, use the data from the post in the posts array from state to show the title. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where did our title come from? How are we doing a timestamp? All of this is lining up with our post from right here. Mm -hmm. So I'll even add that as a note. Um, this data structure is from number nine. Okay, now we do all of this work and we are done. User sees all the posts. We think we're finished. Computer's taking a snooze. And then all of a sudden the user comes down here and number 30 clicks on the read uh, user, clicks on read more button which links us to slash post slash the timestamp for this post from the data coming from the loop. Which is from In other words, when they click on this too, it's going to take us to a post, but because we're using a template literal here, whatever the timestamp is of that post is going to get dropped into that link. Mm -hmm. When they click on that link, that's number 30, the router goes, oh, crap, I got to go back to work, and comes in to number 31 that says URL in browser changed to slash, to, uh, slash post slash timestamp from post. The URL matches the path because the path includes a colon telling the router to expect a variable in the URL, a params variable to be specific. Because the path matches, 
show the post element instead. So we're coming from our home. They clicked on some URL that includes the post and it also includes the timestamp. So this timestamp is actually going to say 2023-1-3-whatever, right? That's going to show the time that post was created. Now, when we go into app.js, we are still getting the slash post, but we're getting whatever timestamp data is part of the URL. So because that matches, we then go to the post element the post component, the post file, all mean the same thing here. So we go into the post, and now we've got more setup that we've got to do. So we say number 30, 32. Yeah, 32. Um, get access to the parameters defined in the path in the route in app.js. We also create a placeholder in state to eventually hold the data to show the post content. Now we come down, we have another stupid, tricky use effect, and we go, OK. We don't care about that. The page isn't done loading for the first time yet. Throw that in the list, throw that in the queue. We'll come back to that. Then it comes down and it goes, oh, if there is not a post, thirty four b thirty four a thirty four b show a message that the post does not exist or hasn't been loaded yet. Now we think we're done, but we're not because it showed something for the first time. It showed this message that's like, oh, it's, it doesn't even, it's either not existing or it's still loading it. So we're done. We showed something up for the first time, now we go back up to our use effect and say, run this use effect now that something sure. has been displayed or returned or rendered the first time. So now we come in and we do number 36, get posts from local storage, 37, parse the posts from JSON string into array. Then we need, we need to match, we need to find the post from local storage that matches the URL, uh, the timestamp param in the URL. We've got all of our different posts, but when we are on this page, we have a timestamp up here in the URL. We need to use this parameter and go find that post that is in from our local storage. So this is. 38B, this is an algorithm. <clears throat> oh my God. Algorithm. Um, A -L -L. Oh God, I knew it looked yeah. wrong. <laughs> this is an algorithm that tells the computer how to match the post array to the timestamp from the params in the URL. So can you explain that a little bit further? Because I'm I'm having a hard time just understanding that. Maybe I'm 
getting it yep. confused with something else. So let's look at what's going on in our local storage. So if I go to the browser and I uh, clear all of this and say console log a JSON dot parse of our window local storage get item hosts. This is our array in, in local storage. Mm -hmm. There are two posts in it. What two posts are in it? There are two posts that are showing up on my home screen, right? So we look at this and the posts have all of the content, the tagline, the timestamp, all of that stuff. But we don't want both of these to show up. We want the one to show up that has this timestamp in it. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop over this array. We're going to get access to each individual post. And if the post timestamp right here and right here line up with whatever URL, whatever is in the URL up here, then that must be the post that we're looking for. So make that content show up. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing in 38A is we're saying go to the posts from storage. Mm -hmm. Go find one by looping over each individual post. And if the post timestamp lines up with the timestamp from the params that are coming from our router, then this must be the individual post we are looking to find. Okay. So since that is the individual post you're looking to find, that is the content that you want to show. Correct. Now okay. we can't we can't just say if the post equals the timestamp because the post has timestamp, tagline, content, all of that stuff. So mm -hmm. this is the algorithm of saying when you're looping through all the posts, when you're trying to find one of the posts, compare the timestamp in the post to the timestamp that's in the URL parameters. Once you do that, once you find one that matches, stick it in matching post. Okay. But now we've got a problem. We've got data that we want to show to the user. So we take the result of the find algorithm from 38 and set it into state. Okay, well, we know how this set stuff works. We come up to number 40. Set is called from number 39. So make the matching post um, be stored in post. Now we've got our post over here. So we come back down to number. 41, and we say ignore this if statement because the post exists. We said if there's not a post, show this message. Mm -hmm. Now there is a post, so we come down to number 42. We skipped the if return from number 41. So we run the code in here. Because whenever we hit a return, it stops any code from running after it. This return is done right here. So none of this is going to run because this has already returned something out. So now we come down here and we say, oh, we're going to return this. We skip this if statement. What do we want to return? Number 43 make the post content stored in state show up using the keys that were set from number nine. Tricky number nine. That's it. Only 43 steps. Yeah. So let me 
this is a this is a better example of use effect. Uh, Schneider said, use effect still isn't clicking. That's okay. What use effect is doing is it saying, hey, this component, we want this component to show up. But the first time this component shows up, we may not have the data for it yet. So what we want to show up is a loading screen. We want to say, hey, you're on the right page. We just have to go get you some data. So that's what we do. If I comment this out just for a second, what we get is po uh, post does not exist or is loading. Why do we get that? Because we did all of this stuff with state. Then we came down here and said, there's not a post yet. We don't know what the post is. So show this loading message. Now we're done the first time this loads. We've shown something to the user. Now, and only now, do we need to go run that use effect because we made our job, we, we finished it, we showed something to them. First load is done, now what do we need to do? Now we need to come in and do this use effect. Now this use effect is gonna go do all of this crap behind the scenes to go get it from local storage and set it into state. Whoa, 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 state got changed. We need to go to our component and rerun the return. So we come down here and we now have a post because our use effect to set that in. So we skip over this return. Now the user doesn't get a loading message. Instead, they got the content that actually came out from local storage. So the use effect is a way to say, let's put up some message saying, hey, things are gonna be loading. Then let's go get the data. And once we have the data, let's go rerun the return of this component to see if that's going to affect what the user sees. Now, Brian, you asked a question 26 hours ago, and you're finally going to get the answer for it. You said, hey, those empty parentheses, what are they doing? These empty parentheses are saying the first time this component loads, after the first load happens, go run this code, go do the local storage stuff. The problem that we run into is that if I copy this timestamp and I go back and I'm in my read more, this component has already loaded. So if I go up and I change my URL up here and hit enter, oh, that was not supposed to work. <laughs> Okay, what I thought was gonna happen was this wasn't gonna change. I thought this ABC wasn't going to change because this component has already shown up. It's already done its work. It's already gone into local storage. It's like, I don't care what happens. I'm already loaded onto the screen. And so if you come over and look in our React terminal, you'll see that there's this pesky little mess uh, message that says React hook use effect is missing a dependency. That means what it's saying is this is only going to run the first time this component shows up. So if over time, for whatever reason, this params timestamp changes, this use effect hypothetically was not supposed to run. So what we're supposed to do is say, hey, when params.timestamp changes, go rerun this code. And now I'm going to go fix this because I've had this for the longest time and delete it out. And I should now have no errors in my terminal. So just to like put a, a situation to that. Yep. Ram that timestamp a situation where that would be changing is like. It changed in the URL. Yep. So would it be. Would it. Would it be okay to say that use effect in some similarities when it comes to like waiting? Yep. Uh, would it be similar to a wait when you're going when you're fetching data? It's similar. Yes. What what the use effect allows us to do is basically say either only run this code after it has shown up for the first time, 
mm -hmm. or when a specific piece of information changes. Okay. So the way you want to think about this is cause and effect. Mm -hmm. The cause is the component showed up for the first time. The effect is whatever we put in right here. The cause may be that the timestamp change. The effect is that we're going to use that new timestamp to go find the new matching post and set that into state. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. Use effect is all about cause and effect. If this array is empty in here, we're saying the cause is the component loaded for the first time. The effect is whatever's going to happen inside the use effect. That's method one. Component shows up for the first time. You want me to go do something. The second way of using a use effect is by saying the cause is that the timestamp changed. The effect is whatever we put in the use effect. Okay. I'm going to show you one more example of your use effect. So you get an example. I'm going to go to my post editor. I've got something in my title. My title is all lined up. It has my value, my on change. I'm good to go. If I wanted something to run when the page first loaded, I'm going to put that in a use effect. I go back over to my browser, I go to my post editor, I get my alert page loaded, I'm good to go. I come in here, I type a letter and I get page loaded. I'm like, whoa, 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 I only wanted you to run when the page first loaded, I just typed something in. Well, the set state, the set title here is like, no, you changed something, I need to go run the return again but I didn't put my empty array in here. So whenever we update the state, this use effect is running again. This use effect is saying, whenever anything anywhere on this page changes, go run that use effect. So what we do is we put our empty parentheses in here. We say only do that when the page first loads. So we come back over here, I type A, B, C, I'm good. I leave the page, I come back to the page, I get my page loaded, and then I'm good to go and I can type things in. Now what if hypothetically I wanted to throw an alert up that said, stop it. But I only wanted stop it to happen when you started typing in a specific title. I could come in here and say, hey, whenever my title changes, check to see if my title equals something specific. And if it does, alert, stop it. <laughs> so I come over here, I refresh the page. Now my stop it doesn't, doesn't run because it's looking for a specific condition. I come in my title, and this is this if statement is going to run every time I type a letter. But when I hit that final P, it says stop it. So this, they call that a dependency array. That's saying what is the cause of this effect? If we leave this blank, this use effect is going to run every single time a re-render happens on the page. If we put an empty array in, it's only going to uh, run the first time the component shows up. And if we put a specific variable in it, it will only run when this variable changes. So if I go in here and type something into my tagline, that's not going to run. But when I type that into my title, that's when that code is going to fire. Just to kind of get some clarification on how that function works. Did you say 
command that time to not play in that instance when that time can't be really helpful examples. Also mean like when it initially first loads, right? Because yes. That counts as a change. It counts, yes. It can change at that correct, but only to the timestamp. So if you have that dependency array there, it will always run the first time the component loads and then any time after that, that the timestamp changes. All right, that's the most complicated reaction I know. I'm, I'm done, I'm finished. <laughs> Guys, take it from here. <laughs> yeah. So in the use effect, um that you the example that you, you provided it said this one? If the title yep so if the title is trump alert stop it but it has to be only in the title because you said it in in the um brackets mm -hmm. array in the dependency array only look if title has changed so if okay. i do something out here that says like effect runs You'll see we get the first time this shows up, effect runs, mm. ignore the duplicates. That's a story for another day. If I come into the tagline and I type a letter, it's not going to change because title has not changed. If I go into the title here and type a letter, now my effect is running every letter that I type because the title has changed, but my if statement inside the use effect is not true. Mm -hmm. So this effect runs is coming out for every single letter I type in the title because the title changed in the dependency. But when I type that final letter, then it comes in here, it sees the if title and it runs this alert. So this is running every single letter that gets typed into the title, not into any of the other fields, except for the first time this component mounts, and then we use our if statement in here to alert or stop it. Okay. Cool. Thank you for that explanation for this code because this is, I needed it. <laughs> there were only, 43 steps. If we just had one more step, it would be the, the official Syracuse number and we would be good to go. So is this 43 steps or 43 demands or commands, I should say, for the computer to run? Or is there a difference? Because I'm thinking of it as yes, you're making commands. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is um uh, we didn't get to the documentation step so i will try and fit that into tomorrow's class um this is the steps that we understand the computer to be executing when following a user interaction path okay so what i mean by that is we are saying hey the user loads the home page, they click the new post button, they type some stuff in, they hit the submit button, they go back to the home page, they click the read more button, and they get to the post page. That would be what we would call our user interaction path or flow. <laughs> Everything that executes in our code in order to make that happen is what we documented. Mm -hmm. We may have simplified a couple steps by saying, hey, on post, we didn't say, hey, import is going in and going into NPM and pulling this out. And then, oh, import is going into another NPM package and pulling that out. That technically is in here. Technically, yes, every line of code should have its own step number. But we kind of simplified that a little bit and said, okay, this is the order that we think about the code executing. And this is close to the order that we wrote the code because we wanted, when the user does this, we want the code to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we documented in here of this is the order that we kind of write the code. 
And because of that, this is the order that when the user interacts with the code, it's going to follow these steps. Okay. Okay, cool. I, I don't know that that fits into either of your two definitions, but. It's a combination of both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely a combination of both. Yeah, so a React event is the same thing as a JavaScript event. So the the best example of an event that we have here is on submit, right? We're submitting the form. The only difference is, is instead of saying document get element by ID on submit equals this function, instead we're able to name the function right here. And because it's in curly braces, JSX knows that it's something JavaScripty coming. And then this add post is called the same thing as add post up here. So it knows to go run that function. That is the clearest example of a event. However, we can also declare an inline event. So we have an on change here. If you notice this code right in here is another function. So this on change is yes, just another event in javascript and react our events almost line up one to one the only difference is we camel case the c in a uh, react event and then we can either define that event as what we call an inline anonymous function that function doesn't have a name so it's considered anonymous but we can either declare that function in line or like add post declare that function higher up as a function here All right, I said no new code. I meant new, no new code. This is it. This is literally everything I know about React. You have been taught. So now we have a week and a day. Well, technically a week because we're off on Monday to practice this. And the good news is it doesn't go away. We use React in your capstone. And we start building out a database. Then we start building out an API. And then we start integrating our APIs through state using effect to return out and render our components that show up in routes to make our app fully functional. Oh my God. Oh. Well, more of it clicked for me tonight. It was, it was really helpful that we went over this mix. What's that, Jennifer? More of it clicked for me tonight. Not all of it, but more than yesterday. So thank you for the review. So the good news is we'll spend a half a class on working on documentation for this. So we're going to start uh, making a diagram. We're going to figure out a visual way to represent this. And then we're going to get our portfolio started in React. So we're going to get more project, more practice starting a uh, app from scratch getting the router installed, moving some vanilla JavaScript code over into our React code. That's what we've got coming tomorrow. But before we jump into the portfolio, we're going to practice uh, documenting our code, making it easier. Documenting, one form of documenting is inline comments. That's certainly one. The other format is, hey, how do we make something visual out of this? How do we represent how all of this is happening? So I'm going to get one started in class. And you guys can decide either to continue using that one, or if you have some other visual representation of, I got this in my head, I want to get it out of my head, you are welcome to use that instead. But we're going to spend a little time tomorrow um, after the uh, AEI folks are here and do an introduction on starting to document our code. Because this is all going back to careers in code. Doesn't matter that you can code. What matters is that you can make a career out of it. And sharing documentation is part of a career in coding. For class tomorrow, 
bring your terms. We will start off with standup and terms. We'll move into documentation and then we'll get going on the portfolio project. Um, do you mind just leaving up the, the shared post, the share code so that I can? Um, I, as soon as I disconnect from the internet to drive home, it will disconnect. Um, but I will go into the live stream channel and paste it all in there and also paste a zip of all of my files in case it's easier to reference that way. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, I can't just leave the live stream open. I know that's easiest. It's okay. I'll just get as much as I can then. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot you're not home. I'm like, why is he not leaving it? Never mind. So I turned my virtual background off in cohort three when I was finally in person because, um, because I, when I, when cohort three started, I didn't have my house. I was still in the market at the time. Um, and so when I finally was able to be in person, I was so excited and people were like, turn your virtual background back on. We don't care that you're in person. Like it's weird seeing things behind you. Like, all right, whatever you want. Okay, all the code is in live stream now as well in case that's easier to reference and a zip in case you wanna just copy it and open the folder and then have that in a new window. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Any final questions for tonight before I sign off? Okay, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys.